He was small and thin and seemed to have a nearly supernatural connection with flight. Flight was all he talked about, all he lived for, all he ever wanted to do. As a college student, he paid for his own flying lessons, tried to join the British RAF, and enlisted as a flight cadet as soon as the Army Air Corps would have him. When he finally made it into combat, he shot down five enemy aircraft in his first two missions. For the next two years, it seemed like every time he went up, the enemy went down. With the end of the war in sight, he embarked on a mission that had a single goal, get enough kills to become the greatest American fighter ace of the war. Instead, he died in a battle that he never expected to fight, killed by an enemy that no one knew existed until almost 30 years later. He is Tommy McGuire, and he is a legend of air power. Thomas Buchanan McGuire, Jr. was born in Ridgewood, New Jersey on August 1st, 1920. His father, Thomas Sr., was a dealer in luxury automobiles, and his mother, Polly, came from a family of wealth and social standing. He was tutored in art and culture, attended exclusive summer camps, and became something of a dandy. But he was also a daredevil, who seemed willing to take huge risks simply to prove his courage. On a dare, he dove into a swimming pool at the Ridgewood Country Club that was filled with snow. And he dove into the snow from a diving board and ended up uh, getting badly skinned. It could have broken his neck. His parents split when he was 10, and mother and only child moved from New Jersey to Sebring, Florida. I think he was actually grateful when they moved to Florida because he was able to start anew and uh, I don't think there was any expectations for him to be a, a tough kid from Jersey. I think he, in fact, he affected a, a Floridian kind of dialect almost immediately. You would have a hard time imagining that uh, McGuire was from New Jersey unless you knew him previously. He was insulated from the Great Depression. Small, almost frail, McGuire played clarinet in the school marching band and seemed to love dressing up in the band's ridiculously fancy uniforms. He always had the nicest car in town, but drove it so wildly that most parents forbade their children from riding with him. Fastidiously dressed, always conscious of what those around him thought, McGuire was in fact considered something of a sissy. Always one to take up a challenge, in his senior year, McGuire went out for the football team. And uh, they decided they'd uh, teach him a lesson. So. They pummeled him for two or three days, and finally, one of the kids on the team said, uh, we've hit that kid with everything we've got, and he keeps coming back. He, he weighed about 130 pounds. And um, they said, uh, he's going to take it as long as we give it out, so let's, uh, let's quit. So they... they uh, quit trying to punish him, and uh, he was one of the guys after that. After graduating high school, McGuire attended Georgia Tech University, but dropped out after only three years to enlist as an aviation cadet. In July 1941, he reported to McDill Field in Florida and later trained in Texas at a quasi-civilian contract school run by retired military pilots. He stood out immediately and was so passionate about flight that when the other cadets went into town, he'd remain on base, looking for someone, anyone, with whom to talk flying. The one time they did talk McGuire into going into town, he met a pretty girl from San Antonio named Marilyn Gosler. Nicknamed, for no apparent reason, Pudgy, Tommy and Marilyn took an almost immediate liking to each other. One of the things about uh, McGuire that's interesting is he was, he was sheltered. I don't see a lot of interaction between he and, and, and females in high school. He's a very shy man. 
but he saw what he liked and he was becoming more and more confident and I think he was not allowed to let Marilyn go after that first date. McGuire got his wings two months after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and was shuffled to Florida for fighter training. He just had a, a, a flat out determination that he was gonna be a leading ace. McGuire requested a combat assignment but was instead relegated to duty flying over the frozen tundra and ice-bound seas of Alaska. He and his fellow pilots patrolled for non-existent Japanese submarines and went gradually stir-crazy. One day, killing time in the abandoned weather station that served as their ready room, McGuire reverted to his high school form and started bragging about his daredevil exploits. McGuire's squadron flew P-39s, an underpowered, overweight tub of an airplane that was legendary for its lack of maneuverability. McGuire bragged that he had once done a loop in a P-39. No one believed him. Soon enough, bets were made, and McGuire was trudging out into the cold to prove his claim. So he went up over the airport, and he did complete a loop in this airplane. And when he landed, he was uh, ordered to report to his CO, and he wrote right in his logbook that he was restricted to the tent for two or three days uh, because he had done this uh, loop over the airfield. Late in 1942, the Air Corps sent McGuire to Harding Field in Louisiana. They were flying uh, east, and uh, they did not have the password for the day. They got caught up in a blizzard, and uh, the people on the ground would not give them instructions, would not uh, uh, vector them into the field because they didn't have the password. So they ended up landing five P-39s in a frozen swamp, so uh, he survived that. McGuire eventually made it home. He married Marilyn, whom he hadn't seen in a year, in San Antonio. They moved to Mississippi, where McGuire was stationed for about six weeks before he shipped out to California to train in the airplane that would make him famous, the Lockheed P-38 Lightning. Since the outbreak of the war, Tommy McGuire had been requesting a combat assignment. Newly married and assigned to a nine to five job in Mississippi, he wanted desperately to get into action. Word circulated among the landlocked pilots that the Air Corps was looking for volunteers to train in P-38s, and McGuire signed up. The P-38 is an interesting airplane. Nicknamed the Lightning, it seemed on paper the perfect aircraft for the war in Europe. It had a longer range than other fighters, was faster, and with two engines, tougher to knock down than most other fighters. However, in action over Europe, the P-38 proved much less effective than expected. The P-38 got a bad reputation in Europe because uh, the uh, engine oil congealed and uh, they would have engines blow up and uh, some pilots went down just because the engines failed. So um, there were P-38s uh, available to be sent to the South Pacific. So the call went out for pilots to fly a plane with a nasty reputation. And though he had only been married for a few weeks, McGuire volunteered. It was, he knew, the shortest route to the battlefield. And McGuire had set a goal for himself that to others might have seemed ridiculous. He wanted to be the greatest fighter ace of them all. In March 1943, McGuire was ordered to report to the 49th Fighter Group, then based in Australia. He named his P-38 Pudgy, after the wife he barely knew. But he saw no combat with the 49th. He did, however, meet Lieutenant Richard Bond, who was the leading American ace at the time, a young farm boy closing in on Eddie Rickenbacker's record of 25 kills from World War I. He was really uh, jealous of Bong. He wanted to, uh, to catch him, but Bong already had 17 or 18 uh, uh, victories by that time, and McGuire was untested. But uh, he told the guys that he would catch uh, Bong. Not surprisingly, McGuire developed a reputation as a big talker. 
transferred in August to the newly formed 475th Fighter Group, his incessant talk about flying and his own desire to be the greatest ace ever so alienated the other pilots that no one wanted to fly with McGuire. So the most natural pilot in the unit was assigned the job of inspecting newly arrived aircraft to make sure they were combat ready. That is where McGuire comes into his own. But McGuire was a sponge, and his abilities kept growing to such an extent that by August of 43, he is confident. The 475th moved to Port Moresby in New Guinea. On August 17th, McGuire ventured out into a real combat zone for the first time, but did not engage the enemy. The next day, attacking the Japanese airdrome at Wewak, McGuire recorded three confirmed kills and hit two other enemy aircraft. He had had gunnery training uh, as part of his cadet training, and he happened to catch on to how all of this worked and he was the master of what they called a deflection shot. He could visualize where this Japanese plane was going to be when the bullets got there, and he would fire ahead and above uh, these planes so that the pull of gravity on the shots he had fired would bring the, the uh, shots and the airplane, the, the target together, and uh, he could fire from a half mile away and hit a plane sometimes. Three days later, in his second combat engagement, he knocked down two Japanese heroes. After two missions, he was an ace. It was not uncommon in New Guinea during that stage of the war for pilots to make ace in a mission or two. Japanese aircraft seemed to arrive for battle in endless waves and just keeping track of who killed what was a nearly impossible task. Ace or not, McGuire didn't slow down. He got his 10th kill in mid-October in fierce fighting over Oro Bay. The next day, with his own plane grounded for repairs, he took his commander's personal P-38 without permission and joined in another fierce fight. In full view of American ships below, he shot down three more Japanese fighters before being shot down himself. He bailed out, was hospitalized and off flight status for nearly two months, but never considered going home. He was married to Marilyn for literally only weeks before he shipped out. And he missed her greatly, and he, they had a, a very touching relationship, but he felt an obligation to his men that exceeded everything else. In December, he was promoted to captain and returned to flight. He quickly recorded three more kills and was promoted to operations officer for the 431st Squadron. With 16 kills in only five months, the skinny, rich kid who talked too much had risen to the point where he actually rivaled Bong. And when his unit moved up to the Philippines, he started attracting the attention of newspaper reporters and the people back home. McGuire was uh, outspoken. He would sit around and talk to anybody. Uh, Bong was uh, quiet. He was from a large family and uh, was raised on a farm. Uh, McGuire was an only child and was an extrovert. So the uh, uh, reporters really uh, crowded around uh, McGuire for the interviews. So the stage was set. The ace race, which had existed largely in McGuire's own mind, now captured the American imagination. And then something happened, something McGuire could do nothing to prevent. The Japanese Air Force disappeared. For five months, McGuire barely saw any Japanese aircraft. He flew hundreds of hours, going sometimes on two missions a day. It was as if the Japanese had simply vanished. And with them, so had McGuire's chances of becoming the greatest fighter pilot of them all. For five months, it seemed as if Tommy McGuire's war had ended. While leading ace Dick Bong took extended leave in the United States, McGuire made up no ground. The Air Corps, in recognition of his leadership abilities, promoted him to commanding officer of the 431st Squadron and moved him to Hollandia. 
In May, the Japanese returned, and McGuire scored a couple of quick kills. But as conscious as he was of his ambition to be the greatest fighter pilot, command was also changing him. McGuire's uh, first sergeant uh, told me that uh, McGuire used to agonize uh, because here he was a young man, uh, 22 and a half, 23 years old, and he's having to sit down and write to the uh, relatives of a pilot that's just died and uh, tell them that he's sorry that they died and give a little bit of information about the uh, circumstances and all. But he said that uh, McGuire got uh, distant from the men because of this, because he'd fly with a guy one day and he doesn't know, maybe he has to sit down that night and write a letter. He insisted that new arrivals address him not as Tommy, but Major McGuire. He began to isolate himself more and more inside a circle of pilots he knew well. In June 1943, Charles Lindbergh arrived on a tour of the South Pacific that had been constructed in large measure to get the world's most famous aviator into combat. Lindbergh, who had plotted air routes across the Pacific for Pan American Airlines, taught the P-38 pilots how to squeeze hundreds of extra miles out of a tank of gas. The P-38 pilots, who were already routinely flying missions that lasted more than four hours, were less than enthusiastic about Lindbergh's formula for extending their missions by two hours. But after the meeting, uh, McGuire went to Charles Lindbergh and said, I don't know how the other people feel about this, but I feel like uh, anything that would uh, extend our range and might save some of my pilots' lives that we ought to learn. So Lindbergh went back to McGuire's squadron to teach the pilots how to maximize their plane's range, and he soon moved into McGuire's tent. The two flew missions together, and Lindbergh called McGuire the finest pilot he'd ever seen. And they were naturals together. They both were charismatic, and Lindbergh thought the world of, of McGuire in the very short time that they spent together. McGuire kept racking up kills, always with Bong in his sights. When Bong scored his 35th kill, the War Department decided the greatest ace of them all was more valuable as a propaganda tool than as a pilot. They took away Bong's plane and gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. After the ceremony, Bong said, it looks like I'm through. They have taken my airplane away. And uh, McGuire said, come on over to our place. We have a plane for you anytime you want to fly. So Bong showed up over there, and they would go hunting together. At 40 kills, the War Department sent Bong to the United States for a bond drive. McGuire saw his chance, but his quest to win the ace race took on a new flavor. It was competitive, yes, and McGuire was certainly inspired by the men of his unit who took such pride in his accomplishments. He went out looking for Japanese aircraft, but couldn't find them. For weeks, he did not record a single kill. He did become somewhat driven because he felt like he was never going to get an opportunity to score. He wanted to go home, and he felt like the best way to do that, and it would have guaranteed him a swift passage, would have been to get 41 victories. He could have grounded himself, but that would have been a betrayal of his men. So instead, he went up looking for Japanese to kill trying to get to the magic number 41 so that he too would be ordered home to sell war bonds. On Christmas Day, 1944, he downed three Japanese aircraft over Manila. The next day, again over Manila, he docked down four more. The score, Bong 40, McGuire 38. Bong had not even made it home and McGuire was going to pass him as the greatest ace. They're down in the, in the area in one of the tents down a line from mine and uh, I go down to say hello to Mac, and uh, everybody's talking about, basically, what do we have to do to get you three? What, wh where can we go, what can we do to get you three? McGuire was on the cusp of incredible fame. 
The Associated Press and New York Times had already written profiles of him, set to be published upon confirmation of his 41st kill. Together, the Flyers cooked up a mission. Early on the morning of January 7th, 1945, McGuire and three other aircraft took off to hunt Japanese planes. The P-38s were heavily armed and loaded with extra fuel and dual belly tanks so they could range far and wide. The weather was gray and visibility limited. A couple of hours into the mission, a single Japanese plane flashed past the formation of P-38s. They just turned as a precaution that, that he wouldn't turn and attack them. But um, McGuire ordered them to keep their wing tanks because he didn't think there was going to be combat. He was wrong. The Japanese plane turned and started firing. At the same time, a second Japanese plane, unknown for decades after the action, stumbled on the scene and started firing as well. McGuire, hearing the distress calls of his wingman, turned toward the battle. What happened next, no one is sure. There are those who think a lucky shot killed McGuire in the cockpit. But it may be something easier than that. McGuire may have turned too sharply, either stalling his plane or causing its structure to fail. McGuire's crew chief told me that uh, every P-38 McGuire ever flew um, was uh, bent out of true, that he actually bent the wings and, and uh, popped rivets and that sort of thing, turning the plane in violent turns. So McGuire made one of these turns, but this was the wrong time to do it. He was at low altitude, at low flying speed, and he had the fuel, full fuel tanks. And he just didn't get away with it this time. Whatever happened, whatever the ultimate cause of the crash, Tommy McGuire's death sent shockwaves through the Pacific theater. A hero who had seemed invincible was dead. And the effect on the morale of those who remained was palpable. Back home, his young wife was devastated. The husband she had barely known was gone. At the ceremony in Patterson, New Jersey, where Marilyn McGuire accepted her husband's posthumous Medal of Honor, a tall, familiar figure slipped quietly into the room. Charles Lindbergh had come to pay his respects. Charles Lindbergh, thought of as the greatest aviator of the time, took Tommy McGuire's widow aside to tell her what a great man she had been married to.